if, for whatever reason, you find testicular size important to you. Yes. That your testicles will become the size of peanuts. Yes, they will. I'm glad we're mentioning this testicular atrophy. Not needed. So they shrink. Welcome to the Dr. Gill Show. This is where we talk about medical matters that matter to you. My guest today is Dr. Mark Grant. Welcome to the show, Mark. Good to be here, Gil. Mark is my friend and my colleague. I've known Mark for longer than 17 years. I've been here in the Midwest for 17 years. But Mark, my former uh, partner who brought me to this area, took me out to dinner with two local doctors. I guess we could just feel each other out. And Mark was at the first dinner I had. Uh, here in the area when we were supposed and we both liked each other and and look at here i'm here and now we've been colleagues for 17 years um as my listeners know i'm a reproductive endocrinologist which is a subspecialty of in the world of OBGYN, where i do you know i've been fully trained in OBGYN, but i do mainly fertility and ivf and special surgery and fertility hormones now mark you like i uh, on the boards are a bur- board certified OBGYN, but you did a fellowship in maternal fetal medicine. Correct. What is maternal fetal medicine, also known as high risk obstetrics? The goal of maternal fetal medicine is to ideally preempt problems. Mm. Your best results are obtained when you meet your patient well in advance of her pregnancy and Ah. make modifications and educate before she even conceives. But much of what I spend my time doing is getting involved after complications have begun. Right, right. Usually you're you're the one we, we would call away way with the fire. You gotta come put out the fire, Mark, where you have a we thought everything was fine and now there's twins or now there's blood pressure or now there's an anomaly or an abnormal heart. Yeah, usually we call you for the to put out the fire. So as a maternal fetal medicine specialist, you did a a fellowship, and you've been on the cutting edge of medicine uh, for all these years, and you've worked very, very, very hard in uh, very high-stress situations. And, and I'm also going to mention your wife is a wonderful OBGYN doctor as well, the the ultimate quintessential power couple. And you have taken your combined practice in an interesting direction. So tell me what type, how have you gone from staying up all night and doing C-sections at 2 a.m. and taking care of quadruplets and all that stuff, which which one can only do for a certain amount of time. I'm fine with saying obstetrics is, is, is for, for young physicians. Tell me about where you've taken your practice uh, in, in the recent years. At the time I trained in maternal fetal medicine, Maternal fetal docs lived at the hospital. Yeah, you lived there. You took transports. Right. You had lots of deliveries. Anytime, day or night, a problem would come into you. My C-section rate was horrific. Because right. that's what you were getting. Percent. Right, they would come breach and in distress. You had to do C-sections. Or twins oh. or triplets. Right. Or severe preeclampsia. But over time, really the role of maternal fetal medicine changed. Uh, at the time I did my original training, they were trying to get maternal fetal docs, and a lot of maternal fetal docs wanted to do this. As the intensivist, you'd have a patient that was profoundly ill. You would manage them in the intensive care unit. Uh, that, and that's so you'd live in the hospital mostly. That really is not ideal. And ultimately, mm. that is kind of faded. But um, over time, MFMs have become more consultants. Ah. So... I am a consultant, in fact, who never goes to a hospital. Right. Long ago, I burned out. Yeah, you can only do it so long, Mark. Your choices are you retire or you find a different way to live. So Laura and I found a different way to live. So we became office-only docs. And consultants. We make recommendations for patients. We take good care of patients. We treat patients, but we don't go to the hospital and deliver patients or provide other care. Laura quit yeah. surgeries a long time ago, 
In fact, a very good experienced obstetrician is fine to do a C-section because you've gotten them there. You've helped them clear those hurdles and whatnot, and they can do a C-section as good as anybody. In fact, surgically, you may find the generalist OBGYN better than the maternal fetal doc because the maternal fetal doc never wanted to do hysterectomies. Right. Never wanted to do any of the GYN surgeries. Right. So when we're down deep in the pelvis, we were never happy there, never comfortable there. So that's a nice delegation of duties or division of, of, of duties there, the work division there. Team. That has worked as a team. That's worked very, very well for you. So you kind of, sh you and Laura shifted over more to consultants. I know Laura is into, has been into women's health, and you've got a wonderful team of uh, nurse practitioners and whatnot. And I know women that love to go to your office for. Uh, both routine health and some urogynecology and so on. But you and Laura have developed a lot of experience with hormones and hormone replacement. When we started this new direction that we went about 17 years ago, okay. it was Laura Grant who was interested in hormone replacement therapy. Okay. And at that point in time, about the only person in central Missouri who embraced hormone replacement therapy was Bill Trumbo. Okay, well, was, a, a very a, a, a now departed, a wonderful OBGYN doctor in our community. Fabulous man, mm -hmm. fabulous doctor. But he embraced hormone replacement therapy and took it places nobody else locally would do that. Ah. So Laura learned from that. Laura became perimenopausal. Perimenopause is the transition between when women are having regular periods, regular ovulation, to when they're not. And we've talked about this with Elizabeth Wilson here about the, the how difficult this perimenopausal transition can be. So she became very interested in hormone replacement therapy. And by virtue of the fact that we are married and we tend to talk medicine incessantly uh, and share articles back and forth. We I'm sure pillow talk is never boring at your house, Mark. Well, other people might find what we talk about boring. So, uh, but we enjoy it enormously, and the opportunities for hormone replacement therapy have really altered in the last few years. So, what I would call relatively recent hormone replacement therapy at its best was transdermal estradiol, okay. oral progesterone. Okay. And if someone really wanted it, you would give them a topical transdermal testosterone cream or gel. All right, let's, let's, let's stop there for a moment. When women go through menopause, the ovaries, which are normally making estrogen and progesterone in cycles roughly every month, eventually peter out, and they stop making lots of estrogen and progesterone. They make a tiny bit of estrogen, tiny bit of progesterone, tiny bit of testosterone, and that's associated with stopping menstruating and some women go through this transition and feel fine some women go through this transition and they feel terrible and every woman who goes this, through this transition is going to be losing bone and it just so happens estrogen is very powerful at preserving bone and the progesterone you were talking about is very effective at preserving the uterus and keeping it safe so People have been arguing for years about should women go, should all women have hormone replacement therapy? And the answer is obviously no. Uh, the answer is obviously yes in women who have a terrible quality of life uh, without these hormones. So what you just described, Mark, was the probably the most common, safest standard of care to give estrogen, and that is through the skin because it's so powerful. It gets right into the blood through the skin. Progesterone capsules, because they came up with a formulation that will actually absorb through the stomach. It's hard to do that, but they were able to do that. And it's a natural progesterone. And then you mentioned something that uh, has been really evolving over the years, and that is testosterone. If you take testosterone by mouth, it goes through the liver and can do some adverse things. So you're talking about maybe starting to give it and start, I don't want to say experiment, or let's say dally or dibble in giving a little extra testosterone on top. So is that a, a fair summary, Mark, about where, you, where we've got to now in this conversation? Yes. And can I back up and throw in a few things? Please throw it. Please flesh that out, because this is really important for our audience. 
So in hormone replacement therapy, uh, historically, people have dwelled on estradiol and progesterone. Okay. Ignoring the fact that while a woman has only one-tenth the testosterone level of a man, she has ten times the amount of testosterone that she does estradiol. Ah, very interesting. And unlike the cyclicity that we get with estradiol and progesterone, testosterone is static in its production. All right. So when a woman is menstruating, her estrogen and progesterone are going up and down every month, but her testosterone is constant. Maybe a little spike around A little ovulation, fluctuation, but, but not much. good baseline, constant mm -hmm. baseline. Interesting. So why does she have 10 times as much testosterone as she does up estradiol? By the way, the estradiol is 100 times as potent molecule for molecule as the testosterone, but numerically, mm -hmm. there are more testosterone molecules than there are estrogen molecules. Interesting. So it's there for a reason. It's not there in the female fetus. It's not there in the female neonate. Uh, but beginning uh, with the time of ovarian cycling beginning, you're okay. going to start producing testosterone. And this is a vitality hormone. This is a ah. metabolic hormone. When, when sex hormone got applied to androgens. To when androgens or testosterone type uh, molecules, okay. Correct. Then we think you only need them for sex. Ah, but this isn't true. That's not true. Nothing will build bone and muscle in a woman like testosterone. So in puberty, when a woman is starting to blossom and become athletic and strong and a, a, a vital human being, you're saying the testosterone production in puberty is, is, is right along there with the estrogen and progesterone in her development as a healthy human being. Necessary. Necessary. It's necessary for her life to be a healthy life. I love it. That is a wonderful, that, that is a new perspective even for me. It provides a sex drive, in addition, mm -hmm. that fades with time. Why is it when you get a perimenopausal woman in her 40s, many times she's starting to fall apart? Right. Emotionally, mm. there's the development of fatigue, mm -hmm. depression, anxiety. Mm. We see this again and again and again, and estrogen may take care of a little bit of that. But it's not going to completely fix these problems. It's not. It may stop bone mining mm -hmm. of calcium, but it's not going to build bone. It's not going to build muscle. If you want to save your muscle, save your bone. Avoid osteoporotic bone fracture. If you wish to avoid frailty uh -huh. when you get into your 70s and 80s, where you have trouble walking, uh -huh. You can't even get to your walker. You can't get across the floor. Whoa. You fall, you break a hip. Now you're in a nursing home. And then you're in the hospital. And then you're dead. And it starts with not enough testosterone. I'm following you, Mark. And let me give you a story from my world. In my training, I was trained to treat menopause, which includes the hormones. And even a, a baby born with ambiguous genitals, I was, I'm supposed to be able to evaluate them. And during my board tests, I had to be yeah, able dude. to answer those questions. But in real life, I'm a fertility doctor, and that's pretty much all I do. Mm -hmm. And I've had to focus on fertility because I've just been so busy just trying to keep up with that. But when I used to treat menopause, the most difficult cases, Mark, were when a woman had her ovaries removed from surgery, it's called surgical castration. All that estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone went through the floor. And I can, I can tell you, woman after woman, we would try to adjust her estrogen, try to adjust her progesterone. They never felt the same, Mark. And I'm realizing I didn't know enough about testosterone, did I, to have a woman feel vital again. You've got to replace it, and it's bigger than that. You can replace it to the physiologic level. It means normal, a normal level. What the laboratory director is going to label normal on that piece of paper. You on that report. That okay. It says normal. So okay. A normal testosterone, according to Quest Diagnostics, is going to be about 2 to 45. But 2 to 45 is a female range. That female range. seems awfully low. 
but that's what they call normal. That's okay, what they're calling normal. within this bell curve distribution. And yet, a perimenopausal woman may be in that range, 22, and yet have all the symptoms of low androgen levels. Ah. So let's take an example of a different disease. Okay. Let's take a disease you get as an adult where your receptors fail. They become resistant. So diabetes. Okay. Resistance to insulin that evolves. Okay. Sometimes related to obesity, sometimes related to the familial genetics. Okay. You may have adequate or even high insulin levels, but the receptors on the cell surface are resistant, and so you end up with a pathology that's present which manifests itself as high blood sugars. And how do you treat that? You push the insulin from the physiologic into the pharmacologic. Or therapeutic. What is called therapeutic. Gotcha. But now you push it up, and you don't really care what the level is. You're not measuring the insulin level. You can. You're right. interested in the end point, which is tight blood sugar control. Keep those sugars in a low level because sugar sticks on to things and creates a lot of havoc and a lot of damage. Inflammation. Yep. And glycation. And glycation. Yeah. Probably does something to inflammation, I would imagine. I'm sure they're cousins. Let's take another disease. Please. Let's take depression. Uh-huh. What is the blood parameter I'm going to measure to figure out where a person is depression-wise? Well, you've come to see me. You say you have depression. Right. What am I going to measure? They have a questionnaire, Mark. It's pencil and paper. It's a questionnaire. Right. So let's see how you feel. What is your subjective mm-hmm. nature of how you're doing? So when you're going to treat people with hormone replacement therapy, it's pretty easy You get someone into the physiologic range Mm -hmm. with their estrogen, their progesterone, they're going to feel great. But with testosterone, if you want that questionnaire to normalize, you want people to smile once again. Right. If you want them to say, Doc, I got my vitality back. You have quelled my anxiety and depression. I once again have an interest in intimacy. I got my mojo back, baby. I hear that all day long. That is what, you know, that really, I mean, we we do treat, I mean, the depression is a great example. There is no blood test for depression. It comes down to symptoms, doesn't it? And nobody seems to have any trouble with starting a a Zoloft or a Celexa, and they feel better, and they pat themselves on the back and adjust the dose, and that's, that's standard of care. Nobody finds any problem with that. Correct. You know what they taught me about testosterone and women in medical school? Please tell me, because that was like like five or ten years ago. Nada. Zero. Nada, it's yeah. 40 years ago. Nothing. They taught me nothing. Right. We learned the pathway, basic function. That was it. And I did a four-year residency in OBGYN. Let's call that a right. four-year study of women's physiology. Sure. Not pregnant. Pregnant. What's your physiology? Sure. Very is, intense. Is testosterone mentioned? Only mm-hmm. to point out it is detrimental. There right, is only disease. if there's skin issues. There is this disease called PCOS. Right. And it is bad. And it's driven by testosterone. Right. And that's the yeah. classic teaching. Right. Not that there's any benefit to testosterone. Not that you need it right. for anything else. Right. They don't teach it. So when you treat women with testosterone, everybody else thinks you're nuts. And they tell yeah. your patient, and they look at the laboratory ranges of that testosterone, which right. may be 150, 300, they're going to go, that's dangerous, stop it. Because right, the computer puts an H, right? If, if, if it is one-tenth above normal, the computer puts an H on there, and everybody thinks they have to address it or they're being a bad doctor. Quest Diagnostics does even worse, and I love Quest. Yeah, I, right. I send most of my We have no Quest. financial interest in Quest. We are neutral. They change the color of the ink. Yeah, they make it a red. It's a red H. It's glowing at me. It's yeah. dangerous. <laughs> treat me, treat me. You better treat it. Uh-huh. So it's sort of a conspiracy to deny women the right to feel as well as they would like to feel. They have wow. the second half of their life 
have the intensity and quality that the first half of their life did. You've done wow. your childbearing. Your kids are out of the house. You right. got them through college. Why shouldn't the quality of your life go up? That, that is profound, Mark. I'm just going to kind of like be with that question and just let it sink in. I, I guess this decisions come down to risks, benefits, alternatives, and costs, like any other important medical decision, doesn't it? So first, let's, let me tell the audience and you what I tell a 45-year-old woman who's come to me with the symptoms of menopause. I would love to hear your boilerplate counseling. Let's, let's hear it. Let's take a million women. Let's divide them into two groups. Half of them are denied hormone replacement therapy. And I say denied because a lot of doctors are still denying women hormone replacement therapy. Okay. Or if they give it to them, they go, you can only have the minimum amount and I can only give it to you for five years. And that's insanity. Okay. Let's take another group of people, 500,000. Those women get appropriate hormone replacement therapy. Let's give them estradiol. Let's call it modern, modern, insightful hormone replacement therapy. Let's follow those women 10, 20, 30 years. What are we going to see? They live on average 3.2 years longer. So this is data. There's data. They There's live, data. okay, they live longer. Live longer. Check that box. Less heart attack. Less well, stroke. Less dementia. Less colon cancer. Less osteoporotic bone fracture. Better quality of life. Less frailty. Oh, my goodness. Oh, less frailty. I have no, no doubt about that. I have no doubt they have less osteoporosis. But this other stuff, is this fairly new data? Could we, we certainly didn't learn that in, in fellowship. When I went to residency training, virtually every study that had ever been published said estradiol. And back then they used a progestin. So you used equine estrogens, 10 different right. horse estrogens derived from pregnant mare's urine, right. pre-mare and premarin, right. which is now ridiculously expensive, and we use bioidentical hormones only, human bioidentical hormones only in our practice. I remember the time, all the articles said, this is what you do. You treat women with estrogen. And if they got a uterus, you got to give them progesterone or a progestin. And they, used, the endometrial lining. And they used to think that uh, progestins uh, protected the breast and they thought because it protected the, the uterus, which was another assumption that was shown to be incorrect. When they put together this study called the Women's Health Initiative, which was a debacle, mm. they purposely chose a progestin. They knew there was data that suggested progestin was a carcinogen in a rat model, and they chose it anyway. They could have chosen bioidentical progesterone, and they didn't. Right. It would seem retrospectively that they were attempting to show that hormone replacement therapy caused breast cancer, which it doesn't. Right. Yeah, yeah. And then let's make this very clear. Pure estrogen probably reduces breast cancer in a population, maybe 40%, 27% or something. Yeah. In fact, the 20-year data out of the Women's Health Initiative for the group of women who had the equine estrogens, so they didn't give them estrogen, 17 beta estradiol. They gave them these horse estrogens. And yet, 20 years out, they had 22% less. 22%. Okay. All Not right. So, had, but if they got breast cancer... It was a less aggressive form. Got it. it was much more apt to be E positive, P positive, HER2 negative. That's the best treatable form. Right. It's most cancer. differentiated. It's not as anaplastic. Correct. And yet, when they stopped that study, I think it was 2002, every doctor in the country, every woman in the country, all they heard was increased risk of breast cancer. It's dangerous. Can't have it. Right. And I remember listening to National Public Radio on the way to work and saying, Oh my! God. My God! Yeah, I want to this pound the pound the radio as I'm driving. Yes, no disaster. Right. And yet, medicine knuckled under and said this must be true. And yet, if you go back and look, and the reason they did what they did to create an effect, they didn't publish this and allow it to be reviewed by scientists and physicians. They took it directly to the press. The press amplified it to the point where uh -huh. nobody could turn it back down. And then when they finally released the data, there was not, in fact, a statistically significant increase in the breast cancer. 
It was a trend, but okay. not a statistically significant increased risk of breast cancer. So they created this abomination where for 20 years women have been denied hormone replacement therapy out of fear, fear that the woman has, the fear that the doctor has. And it's probably resulted in tens of thousands of excess deaths. There was a nice article recently, somewhere within the last six months, I think it was New York Times. It was entitled, Why Are So Many Middle-Aged Women on Antidepressants? And the answer was, because they need hormone replacement therapy. Wow. This is tectonic, Mark. This is, isn't just a little earth. This isn't just a little tremor. This is, the, the, this is, is virtually disruptive in the, in the care of uh, women's health, what you're, what you're suggesting here. Suggesting that you should not be deprived of the hormones that gave you your vitality in your youth. It should continue through the rest of your life. And why would something that you made when you were young suddenly become dangerous when you're old? Name something else that goes from being good to bad. Right. It exist. Evolution would have weeded it out. Well, evolution thinks you're dead by age 30. Yeah, yeah, uh, 30, 40, maybe. You reproduced, yeah. you died. Right. It's all over. You're gone. So right. really, you're not even supposed to be here at age 80. Should have died a long time earlier. Well, there was the occasional crone, and we'll talk about how that would work into evolution. But yeah, but if you were looking at the Dawkins model here, yeah, the, the, the selfish gene, it's passed on. Who cares what happens to you later? Yeah. See, so we're talking about risk benefit. The benefits yes. for women are enormous. All right, I think you've made a good case for benefits here. I, I'm, I'm all ears. I hear all the benefits, and I, I have no doubt. So, can you, to, to, if you're done with the benefits, can you tell me now what are these the risks? Because I'll tell you something. I too was afraid to give too much testosterone or get out of that normal range. I had no experience, no training in going higher. I was afraid to get the H on my lab test. Um. Tell me more. What, what are these risks that I was afraid of that may, may or may not be true? I'll give you a quote from one of the people who have testosterone implanted in our office. It goes like this. The higher my testosterone, the bigger my smile, and the bigger the battle with my chin hairs. So number one. Okay, so... Chin hairs. So some, some facial hair. Okay. So where are your people from in this world becomes the question. Or okay. from a part of the world where you have coarse hairs that are dark, you're probably going to have a big increase in your coarse, dark hairs. Okay. And uh, a small number of women will stop testosterone replacement therapy because they don't like that. Okay. A small number, well, a lot of women, right, after you implant a lot of testosterone, have this instantaneous, nearly instantaneous revitalization of their sexuality. And some of them believe that they feel that there is clitoral enlargement, clitoral megaly. There might well be. But there is not. So, so there's when, measurements. So there's data on this, too. Nobody's measuring clitorises. I, 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 I know a study. I, my my uh, fellowship director actually did one of these studies. She had a centimeter ruler. But, but, but anyway. Well, it's, I can't it's all, find the data. It's all, it's all data. In, in other words, when you hear the word clitoral megaly, define it. Right. Yeah, you need millimeters. I cannot find a millimeter definition. If you've got one as a reproductive endocrinologist, I would love to know what that is. Yeah, normal. You're trying to determine normal values. Or is it the, you know, was I know it's thin. normal when I see it. Right. That's right, what we tend right, to right. go by. But this clitoral mega might just be clitoral sensitivity or arousal or being that now it's back. It's back. It's back. What there is is an enormous amount of blood flow that comes in underneath the clitoris. And it's right. pushed further out, and during intense sexual stimulation, it gets more in size than it has been getting in the f past few decades. Because it was atrophied. Now, yes. it, now it's vital again. Right. So you're back to a, a new normal. Now, that, that uh, exuberance in terms of the genitalia does wear off in a round or two of pellets. Still, the interest in sexuality remains but that sensation that your pelvis is out of control goes away mm. so that's side effect number two that some people might consider adverse and i have had a small number of people get completely freaked out okay. and not want the sexuality in fact i've had okay. people ask me 
can I get all the other benefits that right. I derive from this? I like the fact that I'm not fatigued. I feel right. great. I feel fabulous. I'm not depressed. I'm not anxious. You've taken away my body aches. I'm exercising more. I have more stamina. Mm -hmm. But for whatever reason, I don't want this sexuality going on. It was my never world. my thing. I, some people, sex isn't that. Just, just was never a big part it's of their life. Disruptive, actually. Disruptive right, right, right. People. Sure. I, I don't want this. So we've had a small number of people stop there. Okay. Less than 1%? I'd say less than 1%. Okay. I'd say less than 1% of women will notice intonation changes. In what voice. does intonation mean? It means how do you perceive my voice tonal, tonally? I, I'm, a, I, I'm a musician. That's the first thing I thought. So, so it is sound you're talking about. I'm looking for actual measurements. I don't have actual measurements. So you can go to Wikipedia and it'll tell you what the normal wavelength is for male voices, female voices. And there's overlap there. Sure. So a low female voice may in fact be lower than a particular male's voice. So that overlap exists. But there are women, particularly women who use their voices professionally, who notice that their voice is a little different. A little deeper, a little lower. Yes, or maybe more like they're a smoker. So let's take a look at what so they is... go from soprano one to soprano one to mezzo soprano, maybe but not to alto. They, they just it's a little tiny coloratura now. You're okay. speaking a language I don't understand. But the larynx, I, I grew up in a world of opera singers. Okay, the larynx is a muscle, so it you get any muscle. hypertrophy of that larynx, you're probably going to change the tonality that that okay. larynx can produce. So unless you're a soprano one, meaning the highest singer, usually it's not a, a big deal. And if you did treat a soprano one, maybe you should counsel her beforehand. If your voice is your life, that's how you right. make your living, you might want to temper how you're doing this. You reminded me of the actress Kathleen uh, Turner. She had a very husky voice that most people found very attractive. But. And I have said that to a few people of my patients who said, am I going to worry about it? I'm going to go, Hollywood seemed to value it. Yes, it certainly, it certainly did in that case. So there's another side, risk. Once again, pretty minor. But how about these big ones, Mark? How about the heart attack, liver disease, um, Strokes, the, the big, the, the big bad actors. Well, let's talk about synthetic testosterone, synthetic uh, androgens. Ah, yes. Particularly synthetic androgens given orally. Yes. This will cause liver damage. Okay. This has been associated in the past, particularly among people who abused synthetic androgens in large quantities. They were bodybuilders. Mm hmm. They wanted to look like a steer. Right. And they would buy the stuff off the street, and it's long-lasting oh. and profoundly potent. And okay. yes, there was increased heart attack, stroke, liver failure. And when people talk about testosterone and rage, that's what they're thinking about. So the roid rage isn't just, it's all those other, because they take all these different anabolic steroids, Mark. They take these, I don't even want to go into all the names, but it's huge cocktails. Sure. They're called stacks. So men and women get the exact opposite. It is not rage. It is calming. Women get calmer, you're it saying? calms. Ah. Both genders, both sexes. Both. Ah. Now, when my testosterone failed at age 52, my wife would tell you I was a very grumpy person. Are you telling me you've taken testosterone, Mark? Do you okay. mind sharing that with our audience? 2,600 milligrams implanted in my left flank as we speak. And doing oh, testosterone. so you can you can speak from personal experience. And after we talk about hormone replacement in women, I'd love to talk about it in men. Can we talk about it a little bit in men? Of course, we'll after we here finish done with women. after we finish with women here. Yeah. And let me put a, uh, a little bit more emphasis on this. If you take testosterone, pure testosterone by mouth, every hormone you take by mouth goes through your liver first, and the liver chooses up and metabolizes it and it comes out of the liver not testosterone or very little of it comes out testosterone so testosterone is usually 
chemically mod modified methyl testosterone is the the oldest one because you take methyl testosterone it'll come out the other side of your liver with testosterone activity but in that metabolism in the liver is where some bad stuff can happen clotting factors inflammation i hate talking about lipids because i think they're overblown but we can mention that too i guess so you're saying there's better ways of getting real testosterone into a human female you can do it topically. Topically means through the skin. It absorbs pretty good through the skin. I know we can buy gels and creams and even a local compounding pharmacy will actually make it for us. Here's your problems with the topical. Okay. If you got kids or pets, you're going to ah, get it on them. It's going to rub off. Okay. In fact, we've had the occasional woman come to us whose man is using topical testosterone, and she's already got a high testosterone level, and our first thought is, does she have an ovarian tumor, an adrenal tumor? But sometimes it's just snuggling with hubby, and he's putting on testosterone. So you've seen this. Okay. I mean, it's it, 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 like for the board exams, you need to be able to say, well, but it can be an accidental uh, uh, sure. iatrogenic exposure, whatever you want to call it. But you're saying it actually can happen. It's a real thing. Yes. We've oh, my it. goodness. We've seen people feeding testosterone to their cattle where the woman comes in with a very high testosterone level. So it's a legitimate veterinary use, and it's spilling over, it's getting in their system somehow. I won't speak to the legitimacy of the veterinary use, as I have okay. absolutely no idea. All I know is <laughs> we had a patient who was getting it all over her hands and said, well, I was giving it to my cattle. So I'll be darned. I don't know what they do. Okay. Or why they do it. But it can show up on their blood test. It's okay. anabolic. You'll get a sure. beefier cow. And so you're so, saying, so topically, you also will grow hair where you apply the topical oh. cream or gel. So typically, if someone's going to use a topical testosterone, we tell them to put it behind the knees where they have minimal hair to start with. Brilliant. You don't want to put that on your face. You do not want to rub okay. that all over your face. You're correct. Unless you're in a certain, yeah, okay. The other problem is you're going to have cyclicity. You're going to rub this on once every 24 hours. It'll be absorbed, and then you're breaking it down. So you've got a big sine wave. You're up, you're down, you're up, you're down, you're up, you're down on a 24-hour basis. Really, so it doesn't depot in your skin and stay there and get in evenly. So there's, there's a rhythm even with topical administration. Correct. Very interesting. And you simply, if you need to get someone's testosterone into the pharmacologic range, you can get it into the low pharmacologic range, but probably not the high pharmacologic range. Okay. Topically. So we offer it as an implanted pellet. So people talk about pellet therapy. Okay. And I don't like that terminology. This is an implantable testosterone delivery system. That Which sounds much fancier and more... Medical. Medical. What I do is medical. Sure is. So you deposit typically in the upper outer quadrant of the body. Okay. Because that's typically where women have a little spare tissue. Right. You implant the estradiol and the testosterone. So an average implant would probably be 6 milligrams of estradiol and 150 milligrams of testosterone, or so maybe 125. And are they two separate pellets, Mark? Correct. Do you put them in with the same stick? We use same, a trocar. Same trocar? So first there is an anesthetic agent. Okay, so you numb it up, not bad. And you place a trocar. Which is probably painless at this point. Don't feel it. Make about a two and a half millimeter incision. You slide the trocar in. You deposit the pellets through the trocar into the subcutaneous tissues. You close the skin incision, and you're good for about the next three months. You just need a piece of tape. You don't need a stitch. Right. We do not use a stitch. We use a strip. Call it a butterfly. Call it a strip. Little piece of tape. Close it up. Mm -hmm. And that's good for how long? Please? About three months. Three months. Now, the first time around, people may come back saying, you know, Doc, I felt really good about two weeks ago, three weeks ago. It began to wear off, and I tanked. They can and what feel I tell people it. there, it, oh, it becomes very obvious if wow. you get to the levels where you need them. So realize that that depot is not 100% gone at the end of three months, but you put in the next packet of pellets. And now you've got two implants working for you. A little bit out of the first, uh, more out of the second. And, and then you go to the third, uh, and now you've constantly got more testosterone, more estradiol, 
and the rate of decay of how fast is that level going to fall is yeah. a lot less because you're pulling it out of the remnants of the old packets. Makes a lot of sense. Some people need to see us every three months. Some people get four months. Just depends how good you want to feel. Wow, and they can tell you accurately. Now, how do you determine if they're not if they're getting too much or too little, Mark? Well, obviously, if they're not getting enough, their symptoms are their what they tell you isn't going to be as favorable as you want. How do you know if somebody's getting too much? Do you get blood levels? So about well, before we place testosterone or estradiol in anyone, male or female, we're going to look at a large panel. Of okay. blood work. So you're not doing this blindly. You're giving, you're checking them out for other medical problems. You're screening them. Make sure they're an appropriate candidate safely. Let's make sure your liver's okay. Let's make sure your kidneys are okay. That's called a comprehensive metabolic profile. Let's okay. Make sure your bone marrow is okay. That's a complete blood count. Okay. Let's take a look at what your cholesterol level is. Sometimes we find people with ridiculous levels of cholesterol. I don't go chasing a cholesterol of 209, but you know, yeah. if you're sitting at 350. I'm going to suggest you get a calcium cardiac score at advanced radiology. I'm not advertising for them, but they do a great job. I climbed in that yeah. scanner. And you'd like uh -huh. to be less than 100, and I was 730, and then I had my heart attack. Ah, uh, but you were getting that despite having to. That was more of your genetics. Well, I had you a, knew that was coming anyway. My heart attack was 10 years later than my father's first heart attack. Uh -huh. It didn't so help it did that I had come. a bicuspid aortic valve that was all crusted up. Oh, so you are you were born with a heart with a heart problem. One in forty of us are born with a bicuspid aortic valve. They tend to crust up and then they don't let blood flow. And then you're getting uh, inadequate blood flow down your coronary arteries. And if they're crusted up, now you're in trouble. But if you determine how much calcium is in your arteries, and you know the the ideal way to do that is you're squirting contrast down the arteries and looking at the degree of obstruction. Right. That's but, an angiogram. That's a much different process from Go to the hospital, game. go to sleep, and someone's squirting down your coronary arteries. Die. That's a big deal. I had yeah, that. and making holes in your groin and stuff. Yep. But these days you can start with a cardiac calcium score. And if the cardiac calcium score is very, very low, even though your lipids are high, maybe you don't have a problem. I still think you ought to talk to a cardiologist. And they'll recommend a stat. So they'll statinate you. But I can't tolerate statins. But they did invent this thing called Repatha. But I simply inject once every two weeks, and it took my cholesterol 269 to 113, and I have not altered the way I ate. My good cholesterol is through the roof, and my bad cholesterol has disappeared, and my triglycerides are nothing. Is Ripatha a PCSK9? Yes. All right, we'll talk about I'm, I'm going to get not some an expert experts. on this. I'm going to get some experts in future podcasts talking about It's a miracle of modern science. That's what I'm going to label it. Well, I'm I'm glad you were a candidate. I'm glad your numbers are good. So, in women, you will give one of these implantable devices of estrogen and testosterone. Is there any role for progesterone? Do you ever throw a progesterone pellet in there? Do they have those things yet? By the way, I didn't finish fully answering your last question. Please. So, we do this big panel of labs. Oh, yes. Yeah, so you're screening people for disease. Okay. So, you know, every once in a while, something comes up where we go, you yeah, know, you're really not a good candidate. We don't want to do this. But for the people who get pellets, and that's 99% of people who come see us, six weeks out, five to six weeks out, I want to see what your estradiol and your testosterone levels are. Okay. Whether you're female or male. I want, okay. those, I want to look at those two things. And then once a year, we go back to the big panel. And we don't recheck panels after every installation. We just kind of want to see where you are to begin with. Are you absorbing? And then can we correlate how you're feeling with where we are? But if you're not feeling good, I am not going to deny you going up on your testosterone. If you're continuing to have night sweats, you're going to get more estradiol. Right. If you're continuing to have fatigue and anxiety and depression, I'm going to start going way up on that testosterone. And quite frankly, psychological symptoms okay. require one heck of a lot more testosterone than do physical symptoms. You give somebody a little bit of testosterone, their muscle aches and pains are going to go away. But you've got some pretty bad anxiety it takes a lot of testosterone to fix that, but you can. You but can make you it can. a lot better. I can't, can't tell you how many of my patients, some of them have anxiety. Yes. It seems like it's going up. It is. The prevalence of anxiety is becoming profoundly 
uh, worse. Yeah. And I'll be preaching to the choir when I tell you this, but I think that's what, I think the bisphenol A. BPA. BPA, which is a endocrine disruptor. It looks nothing like an estrogen, but at the fentagram level, causes enormous disruption in your body. Your body thinks it's being inundated by estradiol. Yeah, femtogram, just for people, there's milligram and microgram and picogram, and there's femtogram. We're just talking about it's tiny, tiny, tiny amounts. Okay. Doesn't take much. And I think a, endocrine disruptors are leading to the need for a lot of people to need hormones who shouldn't have otherwise needed them. And certainly we've been aware of people uh, early in life who lose ovarian function, premature ovarian failure, your right. 20s, your 30s, your 40s. Um, but I see more and more people who symptomatically right. behave like someone with the menopause. I told a 37-year-old the other day, you have filled out your questionnaire as if you were a 52-year-old. Ah. So what's going on there? Your labs are normal. You're otherwise healthy. What's going on? And you implant them with testosterone. A lot of times they don't need estradiol. Your estradiol level is fine. That's right. where you can believe the level. You believe the E level you see, but don't believe the T because there's something going wrong with that receptor, we believe. Or host receptor. So the testosterone in each cell is bound by its androgen receptor, which is translocated to the nucleus, which bonds to a promoter sequence mm -hmm. that turns on all the genes downstream that that testosterone should turn on for that particular cell type. So you're going to get one effect for bone, one for muscle, one for brain. Every organ system is going to respond differently in terms of the mRNA that is turned on, which is then translated into proteins. So this really needs to be studied at the level of proteomics. What is your testosterone level and what are the proteins you're making? And then how does that change when I push you into the pharmacologic range? I think that's what's happening. I think there's androgen receptor or after defects. And certainly things bind, proteins bind to those androgen receptors that will upregulate or downregulate what happens when they bind to that promoter sequence on the DNA. So let me summarize this. When you screen people and find the appropriate, somebody who is not going to have a high risk from this type of hormone replacement therapy, you can give these medicines safely, and you can see, let's say the majority of people experience actual benefit. In many ways. In, in many, many ways. Well, it sounds almost too good to be true, Mark. Um, do you know who believes it's true? Those of us who do it. Those who have had it done to them because right. of their needs. But then you've got the entire rest of the medical community who tends to be against it because they know nothing about it. And they tend to be concerned. They poop. The, in medicine, you you poo-poo it first. Your first reaction is deny. Right. You have to bring them kicking and screaming. We could go on and on about examples in medicine where that's the... The case. I, we just talked. I talked about this with uh, Dr. Beverstorff recently. The Helicobacter. The uh, the it, it took the person who showed that bacteria cause ulcers had to take it himself until they would finally believe him. Right? They poo pooed it. Well, he taught me the gut was sterile when I went to medical school. The who was sterile? The gut. Oh, the gut, the gut yeah, was sterile. Right, 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 there's right. no bacteria in the gut. And the uterus is sterile, and the brain it's is sterile. sterile. And it's there's no sterile. lymphatics, and the, the brain is protected from the immune system. The, the, all these things just falling. All are wrong. Falling by the wayside as we learn more. What's true today yeah. is not true tomorrow. What is truth? But now we're getting philosophical. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> So how about before we leave female uh, hormone replacement, how do you determine what woman needs progesterone? I suspect you give true, true to form natural progesterone, what we call P4. And when do you give it and how do you give it? We typically prescribe this as oral micronized progesterone. Okay. Typically it's 200 milligrams by mouth at bedtime. 
If you have a uterus, you have to have progesterone to keep you from developing a thickened endometrium with vaginal okay. bleeding and then potentially endometrial cancer. Okay. When you stick your progesterone, you're not going to get endometrial cancer. And if you develop any vaginal bleeding, we do an ultrasound, make sure your endometrial lining is not too thick. But then we just go up on your progesterone. So it is the counterbalance to the estradiol. Okay. And it has two effects. Number one, it will keep the endometrial lining thin. Number two, it will make you sleep like a baby. So it promotes sleep. Yes. I'm aware of that. I just wanted you to say that for me. So we don't say take it first thing in the morning. So you take it at night. Take it at night. And That's the it. oral micronize, it's a special gel where the progesterone is made into tiny little nanoparticle has lost it, has become a bad name, but it's a good thing in this case. These are nanoparticles. <clears throat> they absorb in the in the gut. And that's the type of progesterone you use. It's not going to be in any of these pellets. We uh, don't know precisely why no one has come up with a progesterone pellet. It well, one, is, one thing is it, it's such a weak molecule. You've got to give hundreds of milligrams. So it's going to be yes. big. It's physically going to be a big yes. chunk yes. of mass. Yeah. And there's a thought that maybe it's not absorbing well out of there. But I bet the mass concept is the more correct concept. We give a lot of progesterone in my world of fertility, and we give it in oil. It's kind of barbaric. But if it's dissolved in oil and you put a big, you know, one or two cc's of oil in the muscle or whatnot, it gets in pretty good. It just hurts. You need it's a lot a of progesterone needle. to support an early pregnancy. Oh, and the recent studies, while, while, while we're talking about it, showed that really um, we thought for a while that vaginal progesterone, just putting it near the uterus, was just as good. And it turns out that was wrong. You need good blood levels. And the best way to get blood levels is with injection. Born out, born out yet again. More studies. I won't get into that because that's not what today's about. So there's a very... I would think a thorough description of, of hormone replacement therapy in women. It only scratches so, the surface. We could go on for days. He, but for the purpose of this <laughs> podcast, I am very impressed. I'm impressed that it's safe. I'm impressed that it can, can be effective. And, I, and I'm going to tell you a story. I, names will be changed, will be avoided to protect the innocent. But I had a woman come to me for hormone replacement. And I gave her the traditional, and she didn't feel. And I know she went to see you all, and I know her testosterone levels are better. And when I see her around town, she says she feels much better. And I say, I'm very happy you went to a doctor that has experience with this that I don't have. So we've got all this experience in hormone replacement in, in women. So it just seems logical. Maybe if you, you know, you've just told me you've, you've taken it yourself. You've gotten into to, into administering it in men and offering it as a treatment in men? So we have men coming to Women's Wellness Center and sitting in our lobby. Right, the husbands and the boyfriends, <laughs> right? But we are also now Columbia Hormone Health. Ah. To accommodate the men. So I take care of a lot of men. Uh, our nurse practitioner, Dr. Shannon Sitzman, does as well. And so... To me, here's my story. First okay. of all, before I went into OBGYN, I did a year of family medicine. So I took care of women and men, and I'm perfectly comfortable taking care of men. Good. Because it seems kind of crazy to an OBGYN to take care of men. But I did it early in my career. And then, at age 52, I fell apart. I had been the Energizer Bunny. Go, yeah. go, go. Right. 24 hours a day. Never stop. Mind always quick. Right. Never depressed, never anxious, muscles never hurt, great stamina, go forever. And it all stopped. It all fell apart. I didn't want to get out of bed, and I didn't want to get off the sofa. It was hard to work an eight-hour day. I was exhausted, and I was anxious, and I was depressed, and my wife said I was grumpy, and I was grumpy. And my testosterone was 225. That is, is that technically low, or it's the, certainly the low, low, low end of normal? So in men... It is considered hypogonadism if you're below 300. Unfortunately, that has no meaning whatsoever. If you try to find the origin of that number, you cannot find it. It is non-existent. Someone made it up. 
it's probably a statistical number from a certain standard deviation without biological significance, probably new, had, statistical only. I've had men with a 316 told by their primary care doctor, yours is normal. You are not hypermetic. Right. You don't need testosterone. Right. We just had this discussion about thyroid with a medical endocrinologist. If it's normal, a lot of doctors say, hey, it's fine. It's fine. And it doesn't. Normal means you're in a range. doesn't mean you're healthy. You know, the thyroid receptor is a lot like the steroid hormone receptor. Sure. There are response elements on the DNA that get turned on. Yeah. And see, so it's a nuclear, it's a nuclear acting uh, hormone. Particularly when I see autoimmune thyroiditis, I think there's something going on at the receptor level. That's why we have to push the hormone levels so high in that particular disease process. But I digress. Yes, we were talking about men. So you, you started taking, you mentioned that you... At 52, the ener Mark was no longer the Energizer Bunny. Nope. So you developed some it. personal experience with this. I would have had to retire. Oh. I was a mess. But I'm 67, and I'm still working, and I do 40 hours a week. And I take care of my vineyard, and I take care of my orchard. Oh, I know. But I will tell the audience, I asked Mark to do this months ago, but he's been tending his vineyard. I finally got a little window. I assume he'll be stomping on his grapes with his bare feet soon enough, but I have this little window. I was up here two hours this morning. They're, the buffines are happy. <laughs> so you're it's that, you, so yeah. you had personal experience with this and you go like, whoa, this, this is important. Life I could share this. Changing. This was life changing. Oh, that's beautiful. So I am making available to other men what saved my life, saved my career, heck, maybe saved my marriage. How long was my wife going to put up with me being all grumpy? Right. So 15 years ago, you started testosterone? 15 years ago. Initially as an injector, because that's all I could get in Columbia, Missouri. Right. Right. Up and down, oscillate. Up and down, up and down. You're feeling good, then you're not feeling good, then you're not. Right, you got to have a shot every two, two weeks or so. So it was 200 milligrams every two weeks, and it went mm. to 100 milligram once a week. But still, when you only got 100, your level didn't get as high. You didn't feel as right. good. Right. But then you still had that cyclicity of coming and going. So ultimately, pellets were introduced into the Columbia area, but they weren't implanting enough. Yes, I felt much better. And you'd get this solid, ongoing level. Enough, of you testosterone. mean by dose? Dose. Okay. So it did plant about 900 milligrams in me. And I'd feel pretty good for about three months, maybe get my level up to 700. Mm -hmm. But it takes a lot more than that. So to make a man feel like he did when he was 20, you've really got to put his level back where it was at about 20. Now, okay. the textbooks are going to tell you that's, that normal is 300 to 900. Right. But I feel my best when I'm over 1,000 or 1,200. Okay. And there's no harm. You're not going to find any harm associated with that. So let's talk about that. What are the harms? I mean, we talked about the potential harms in women. What could be the harms in men? I'm going to go right to prostate. Is this going to enlarge your prostate? Does this cause prostatic cancer is the first question. No. Okay. Not, but I'm okay with that. Do I want to put testosterone knowingly in a man that has testo uh, uh, prostatic cancer? No. No, I don't. So, so you can test PSA. for that? Yeah, if your PSA is in the normal range, then you can safely do this. And thereafter, we check a PSA once a year. Okay, so that's part of the screening of a guy. You're not going to get a PSA in a woman, but you get a PSA in a guy as part of your screening tests. So testosterone has two major active metabolites. Okay. The way women get estradiol is they make testosterone and convert it to estradiol. That's Correct. one major metabolite. It's called aromatization. Correct. And we can use aromatase inhibitors, and we'll get to that in just a minute. Ah. So the other major metabolite of testosterone is dihydrotestosterone, mm. which happens in women in hair follicles. That's why they may have hair growth issues they don't like. And we put them on spironolactone to slow that down. Okay. And if they're having hair loss, we can put them on spironolactone or Rogaine. Or both. Or both. You can get those compounded together. Okay. In a male, you're going to have dihydrotestosterone occur in the hair cells. And if you're losing hair, 
I can put you on not spironolactone. That may cause gynecomastia in a man. That means a breast enlargement. Correct. But we would prefer to either use Rogaine or finasteride, which is a okay. 5-alpha reductase inhibitor. Okay. So 5-alpha reductase converts testosterone to dihydrotestosterone. Dihydrotestosterone is many times more potent than testosterone. Now, the place a male has this 5-alpha reductase is in the prostate. Prostate. So if a man has benign prostatic hypertrophy, he comes to me with a weak stream, as he may call it. Right. Finasteride will block that conversion of testosterone to dihydrotestosterone, and he won't get benign prostatic hypertrophy. Now, here's one of the problems. Go ahead. If you start the finasteride at the same time you instill the testosterone, yeah. you're blocking way too much of it down. The pace... The patient has come to you with a T level of 250. All and right. now you're stopping all conversion of testosterone to dihydrotestosterone. And suddenly he's got extreme impotence. He's having failure in the bedroom and he's not uh, happy with that. So you've got to get the level up to around 1,000 and then start your finasteride. See, these are, these are things that experience teach, Mark, why you need to go to an ex- somebody with experience like you have. So the way you get this is through experience. Yeah. And, and, and chatting among the other experts, you get into the club of experts, and you go to conferences, read. I'm finding these Facebook chats. I, I'm in various Facebook chat rooms with reproductive endocrinologists, special surgeons, and we, we chat. And so we're, we really help each other stay you know, current. At the top end, I think that's good. Right. I'm now going to say something derogatory that I probably shouldn't say, but I'm going to go Go for it. it. This is our podcast. We can say whatever we want. Too many people get into treating pelletized hormone replacement therapy. They haven't studied the science. They have no idea oh, what they're doing. They have I'm, no experience. It's just a business model. Hey, there's a, there's, an, um, there's a potential need for testosterone. Let's open a clinic and start. They're doing it with the uh, Wigovi, with the weight loss drugs, and they did it with HCG five, ten years ago. There was an HCG clinic. Yeah, people, it's, a business, it's cash on the barrel head, and, and people do these things. But I did lose 43 pounds on Manjaro. Yeah. Five months of Manjaro. You look great, pounds. Mark. By the way, you look great. When Mark walked in, folks, he looked fit. His veins, he's got great veinage, by the way. <laughs> Much better veinage on his arms, if you can't see that. And uh, clearly, um, you're taking good care of yourself, Mark. So, you will treat men. We we'll do. You, you do daily, treat men on a daily basis. There's tricks like finasteride to prevent prostate problems. You can confidently avoid giving testosterone in a man that's going to fire up a prostate cancer. This does not cause heart attack. This does not cause stroke. When you see old data, they were talking about not bioidentical testosterone. They're talking right. about the methyl testosterone. The methyl testosterones. Very dangerous products. We don't use that. Right. Just everything we do is bioidentical testosterone. And I don't even like the term bioidentical or body mm-hmm. identical. It's the same thing your body has always made. So what do you like? You just call it testosterone? It's testosterone. Okay. It's not methyl testosterone. It's not anything else. It's testosterone. And somebody in the know should know that that's, that happens to be bioidentical. Okay. Now, I talked about 5-alpha reductase, but you had previously mentioned aromatase. Right. Men can convert testosterone to estradiol as well. That's why you see the bodybuilders, they call it gyno. They can get boobs from all these uh, these androgens, which are converted to estrogens. So you can convert, the, you can block conversion of testosterone to estradiol with an aromatase inhibitor. Do you use Femera, Letrozole? Um, or Arimidex. Arimidex. Yeah. So we have a company that produces this in an implantable form. Oh! If I find a guy that's got an estradiol level, he started at 26, he's now 60, we implant 16 milligrams of um, an astrazole. Can you put it in that same trocar? It's already embedded in the testosterone pellet. So it's been formulated like that. And I can give it orally. Now, if you give, and and I learned this. The Arimidex, not the testosterone, the Arimidex. Correct. Now, early on when I was an injector, and it's the injectors who get the worst problems with conversion of testosterone to estradiol. I got a really high estradiol level, and I was given an astrazole, or call it a Remedex, one milligram once daily. All right. And I developed horrible muscle and joint pain. Ah. So if you give it in an implanted form, you're not going to do that. 
But while you're trying to get the levels back down acutely, you can give them a milligram twice a week and you shouldn't have muscle and joint pain, and yet you drop the estradiol. What, what's causing the muscle and joint pain? Probably the muscles and joints enjoy just a little bit of estradiol. Men need estradiol. Just yes. as women need testosterone. And yeah, people don't know this. The reason men have bigger bones than women is because we've got all this testosterone that's getting converted to estrogen in our bones. We have higher bone estrogen than women, probably, at least when we're young. And nothing will build bone better than testosterone. It builds bone better than any of the drugs that are given to women for osteoporosis, osteopenia. Ah, I didn't know that. I thought they've those, got these these wonderful new uh, in bio, you know, biotech injectable. I'm not going to get into all the names of them, but you're saying testosterone will work better, and it doesn't have nasty side effects. Right. Say the mention these drug treatments for osteoporosis in front of a dentist and watch them recoil in horror because right, they've right. seen what happens to the jaw. And we're not talking just bisphosphonates. We're talking about the other ones, too. Interesting. Interesting. We consider if you've got weak bones, testosterone is your drug. You need it. Lots of needs for this. Wow. So back to men. Back to men. So doesn't cause heart attack, doesn't cause stroke, does not cause prostate cancer. You will read things about your blood getting too thick. Okay. But on this 15 years, I've never had to give blood. I've never had to have excess blood pulled because my blood got too thick. And it's because it's the injectors who tend to get their blood too thick. It tends Rather to Rather than the pelts the versus the, the implants. Correct. And you've never had a patient get a deep vein thrombosis or a DVT going to the lungs called a pulmonary embolism or a PE. To this point in time, that has not happened. We do not believe there is an increased risk of thromboembolic phenomenon from testosterone. And in fact, even when you exceed the laboratory norms for hemoglobin and hematocrit, you're probably not at real risk of a thromboembolic phenomenon. They give you those norms to separate out what happens in a disease process. Mm. Testosterone is not a disease. So if you've got a disease that has caused you to get an exceptionally high hemoglobin and hematocrit, a bone marrow disorder, let us say, mm. that is a very different scenario than having a high hemoglobin and hematocrit because you're on testosterone. You're sick. Gotcha. It's a different cause. Probably inflamed. Gotcha. So... You can give testosterone via implant. You can control symptoms in people who need it with finasteride or irimidex. And you can give it safely. Correct. And people start feeling great like you, and they go back to working 40 hours a week. Save people's lives. And save, save people's, people's jobs. Lives. Save people's marriage. Well, that's why we do this, isn't it, Mark? To be able to give back. Make a difference. Make a in difference. Lives. You know the number one reason men come to see me? I'll go, how'd you get here? Right. They'll go, oh, you put pellets in my wife. Ah, I got to keep up with her now. <laughs> and then what? <laughs> I can't keep up, Doc. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's wonderful. And obviously, the young men who, who are trying to have a baby, they, they, you're telling them that's going to crash your sperm. And so, do you, so for men with low testosterone who are trying to have a baby, do you leave those treatments to the special urologist we have in fact i'll use his name dr mecklin we we had a he was one of my first podcasts here he's very comfortable with these medicines or will you for example uh, give hcg or clomid to a man which generally helps the sperm and will also increase testosterone yeah i actually had someone come to me on clomid who had had a, I'll call it a moderate rise in his testosterone level from the clomid. Mm -hmm. But um, talk to any of the women you put on clomid to make them ovulate. They're going to tell you clomid makes you feel terrible. We call it the clomid crazies, Mark. Does the same thing to men. So, so I don't use clomid. I don't use HCG. And uh, I thus far have not had a man come to my practice who had not completed the Child family. Birth. Okay. So if you have not Fair. completed the family, 
I say, go bank some sperm with Dr. Gail Wilshire. Right, right. Get I assume you frozen. bank. Yeah. But so far, right. even the, you know, I've seen men in their 30s with a testosterone level uh, below 100. Miserable. They're miserable. Mm -hmm. But fortunately, they've completed childbearing, the ones that have come to me so far. And so I don't have to worry about their sperm count going down. I do warn men, if, for whatever reason, you find testicular size important to you. Yes. That your testicles will become the size of peanuts. Yes, they will. I'm glad we're mentioning this testicular atrophy. Not needed. So they shrink. Right. Because let me explain this to the audience here. You're giving testosterone. The brain is saying, hey, I, my testes are making plenty. And it stops sending the signals to the testes to grow. These are called LH and FSH, primarily LH for testicular size. Well, actually both for size, LH for testosterone. Nevertheless, your brain stops telling your pituitary to release these hormones and the testes will shrink. That's expected. Mm -hmm. So... You can counteract that somewhat with HCG injections. It's it's, but for your guys, it's not important. It's got to be fairly frequent, probably once a week or more injection. And as I understand it, HCG has gotten pretty expensive, and I don't have any experience. Oh, with it. It, it, it's all gotten so expensive that mm -hmm. my that 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 my I want to call it Bonjoro, the my <laughs> the Munjara. Well, well, that's that cost me eleven hundred bucks a month. Eleven hundred, yeah. But now I'm getting it in the compounded form. Oh, you can get a generic. So semaglutide, terzipatide can both okay. be gotten compounded. I don't know that you'd call it generic. It's compounded. compounded. There are compounding ah. pharmacies that make this available. Because there is a big shortage right now because it's all the rage. I mean, Charles Barkley just, just said he lost 62 pounds, and it's good enough for Charles Barkley. And Mark Graham, maybe it's good enough for me. So very interesting. I quit being a chronic hypertensive when I lost 43 pounds. I quit needing to sleep in CPAP. Now, every time I walk up a step, I'm carrying 43 pounds less. Can you imagine the yeah. liberation of laying down a box weighing 43 pounds before you walk yeah. up a flight of stairs? A ruck. <laughs> You're not <laughs> rucksacking your belly. <laughs> I love it. So I guess just the one more little observation is this is probably a lifelong thing. If a woman or a man stops what they've started doing with hormone replacement therapy, they're very quickly going right back to where they were. But as I tell my patients, I'm not going to stop breathing air, and I'm not going to stop drinking right. water, and I'm not going to stop eating food. And if I right. have hypothyroidism, which I do, I'm not going to quit taking my thyroid, thyroid medication. And I will continue my testosterone until the day I die. And hopefully, I will avoid... What happens to a lot of little old men? You get that fragility. You yeah. don't have any muscle mass. Men break hips too. And they lose bone. You are yeah. correct. And what bone. good is it to live into your 96 if you can't get off the sofa the last 20 years of your life? Yeah, doctor that many of us respect, Peter Adia, or Atia, I believe he pronounced his name, Atia, just wrote a book on this, on longevity and markers and things you can do about it. And one of the strongest correlates of uh, longevity and quality of life is is grip strength. How strong are you? And grip strength kind of takes every all your weight lifting and all your exercise kind of and is a kind of a nice average for how strong you are. And that's apparently so strongly associated with longevity is about fivefold more important than almost every other intervention. So what are the things they up with? look at in older men mm. <clears throat> who are hypogonadic? And they're going to give them some testosterone replacement therapy is grip strength. And you can clearly increase grip strength in the older male who is hypogonadic. But the mm -hmm. doses of testosterone they use in those studies is pitifully. <laughs> it's it's, it's low, almost homeopathic. It's almost nothing. But, but they still can show a benefit with low dose. Yes, they do. Wow. So I'm not here to help the bodybuilder get bigger guns. Right. But this will have the average man and woman maintain their muscle mass. It's important to maintain your muscle mass. Your muscles, when you work them out, are gonna release all sorts of myokines that are good for your heart, your brain, all parts of you, your mood. And lowers your sugars <clears throat> and, and your mood. Oh, it just goes on and on and on. By the doesn't, way, help, doesn't help you lose weight, but that's a whole nother talk. Other than that, it's great. I've put enough testosterone in some males that have lost a lot of weight just because they're now 
capable mm. of working out. Yeah, and they and, couldn't before. And it may it may turn up uh, lipolysis and fat cells. So, by the way, when you were talking about glucose metabolism, I will tell you that uh, at the end of five months of Manjaro, my hemoglobin A one C went down to five point six to five point zero. So that tells you what that drug does to glucose metabolism. Right. And 5.6 is already normal. So it was normal. a lower. A, 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 so you went from normal to normal, but it, your, your blood sugars went down. Correct. They went down. Fascinating. So the GLP-1 agonist, I know this is not what that show's about. These Please. are miracle drugs. Okay. This is going to change everything. These will become oral. These will ultimately become an expensive. Yeah, Victoza is an oral version of semaglutide. It's not as powerful on paper, but it still has benefits. I still have questions about long-term safety of these medicines. I, I think they probably have addictive potential in, 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 in that uh, people, when they don't feel the satiety after eating uh, off the medicines, uh, they're going to gain the weight right back. I think more is to be said, but certainly it's an exciting new type of medication, and certainly more more will be revealed. I'm certainly open to uh, uh, to more data, and uh, who knows? I gain a pound a week when I'm off my Manjaro. There you go. So go back on it for a week, come off it for two or three weeks. Go on it for a week, come off for two or three weeks. Yeah, and while we're talking about muscle, I'm... I'm also worried about it, it, not just fat loss, but muscle loss. On Tia's medicines. worried about that too. Yeah, apparently it's it's fifty fit instead of ninety ten. If you lose weight on a on a you know a ketogenic diet, you lose about ninety percent of the weight as fat. Whereas I I'm told that with Manjaro, you you will lose fifty fifty. You'll lose a lot of muscle mass too, which obviously has I've I've got a problem with. But we'll, we will see. I've looked for that scientific data and I can't find it. I know Atia is very concerned about it. But when I was researching this, I did find out that humans like cattle marble. We mar oh, yeah. Well, fat gets in our cells and, and, de and increases uh, or decreases insulin sensitivity. We do marble. So if you're taking fat out of my muscle, my muscle circumference is going to shrink. Okay, but I, I think you're doing DEXA scans and... Whatnot, it's just it's giving us actual differences in, in water and signal and whatnot, but I'm not an expert on that. So let's just say we will look with anticipation where this field of pharmacology is going to go. Looking for the data, Gil. Looking Fantastic. forward to it. Well, Mark, what a pleasure talking to you today. I have learned so much. You look great. I'm so glad I was able to get a couple hours out of your day from the rest you from the vineyards to share your knowledge and your experience with our with our audience, and, and I'm very, very grateful. I'm glad to call you a colleague and a friend. Thank you again for coming. Pleasure to be here, Dr. Gill. Thank you.